Up to the next one, have a wonderful day, and I'll see everyone later. Bye. Greetings, everybody. Yeah, it's been quite a long while once again, hasn't it? Um, yeah, been getting absolutely destroyed by university assignments and um, yeah, just university stuff in general over the past couple of weeks. So haven't had that much time to record a proper YouTube video. I did post like um, a little special video like one or two weeks ago. You guys might have seen that. Um, but yeah, hopefully now we're back to making proper videos. Um, on a regular, hopefully, basis. Yeah, assignments are done. I have exams in like three weeks or two weeks actually. It's my first exam. Um, so I have a little bit of time to record videos for you guys. Um, what are we doing today, by the way? We're taking a look at this um, complex analysis integral. Um, it's the integral from zero to infinity of one over x to the n plus one, where n is, well, the way we're gonna do it, n is going to be an integer that's going to be greater than or equal to two. Um, but you can generalize this to any real number to n greater than 1, um, and this thing will converge. So I've done a video on this in the past, actually, um, like two years ago, when I was a little baby in year 12. Um, and yeah, that video didn't really turn out that great. It was my first time recording on a proper whiteboard in front of a camera and everything. So I had some complaints in the comments, I think, that the camera was too far away. So hopefully now, future viewers of this integral have a bit more of a pleasant time viewing. Um, but yeah, we're going to take a look at this integral today. Um, complex analysis, of course, where hopefully I remember how to do this thing, um, even though it's been like two years. So first of all, how do we usually approach these? What we're dealing with an improper integral, and we see that we have something to integrate here. So we might as well call that integrand. Uh, we rename it a function f of z. So we let f of z be equal to just the int integrand, but we replace all the x's with z. So that's going to be z to the n, and then now we have a plus one. And the idea is we're going to be integrating this function f of z um, in some way in the complex plane. So usually if you have just polynomials and whatnot, it's just fine to um, replace x's with z. Okay, so once we have a function, we do need to figure out how to integrate it. Um, before we do that, though, it is very important to figure out what the poles are because the poles are going to tell us roughly what our, what our contour should look like. So how do we figure out the poles? Let's do it um, up over here. So the poles of this function f of z, um, well, it's pretty obvious where they're going to occur or how we should find them. We're dividing by something, a polynomial, z to the n plus 1. So poles are going to occur whenever our polynomial in the denominator is equal to zero. Um, so we're trying to find the roots of this polynomial z to the n. Um, so we're solving z to the n um, plus one is equal to zero. Okay, so how do we go about doing this? Well, I've made a video um, also two years ago. Um, you can probably find it on somewhere on my channel that I go into detail how to solve this polynomial. But just quickly, how can we do this? Well, we have z to the n, bringing the one onto the other side, we have minus one. And now, since we're dealing with powers here in the complex plane, it's nice to work in polar form if you're working with powers. So we can rewrite negative one as e to the i times pi. And now here, you could go ahead and take the nth roots on both sides, but you'll notice that we're gonna get one solution only, which is not that great because um, we're expecting n unit solutions there. It's the roots of unity or something like that. Um, so what's the trick to getting all the roots here? Well, we're just going to multiply this guy by e to the 2 pi i times some integer k. Now k, we don't need to take to be all the integers. We can just take to be a very special set of integers. Um, k, we can only take, or we only need to take to be the integers, um, 0, 1, all the way up until we get to, well, it's going to be n minus 1. Um, this is because we're expecting n solutions out of this polynomial. So we have n k values here pretty much that we need to plug in. Um, and if it turns out if you go to n and then you keep going, then you're just going to be repeating your roots. Um, so there's no point to keep on going. You can just stop at n minus 1. Okay. So this is quite nice because now we can... Notice that z to the n, we can write this as what well, we have e, and if we bring those two exponents together, you will notice that we can factor out i times pi, and we're left with what's that? 1 and then plus 2k in the exponents. We can factor that out. So we have i times pi, and then um, 2k plus 1. So this is what we have, and now we can take the nth roots on both sides, so just raising both. 
um, sides to the 1 over m. And then we're going to recover our solution for z. And that's going to be equal to e. And then we have i. We have pi over m. And then we have 2k plus 1. And these are basically all the poles that we're going to get um, on our function, f of z. Okay. So where exactly do these poles occur? Well, let's just jump back over here. We're going to try to plot it out on the complex plane a little bit, and we might as well draw our contour here as well. So here's a rough diagram of the complex plane, I guess. So this is um, the real part of Z. And then up over here, we have the imaginary part of Z. So where do these poles over here occur? Um, well, you'll notice we have e to the i pi over n, and then this 2k plus 1, these are just odd multiples. So we can just select any points on the unit circle to begin with. So these are on the unit circle, pretty obvious. Um, so we can select some points over here. So this would be, for example, e to the i, and then 1 pi over n. The real axis, um, this is where e to the i 0 pi over n would lie, actually. Um, so if you go 0 and then 1, 2, there's no pole there because the next one is, if you plug k equals 1, you're going to get 3 over there. So you go 1, 2, and then 3. That's probably going to be up over here somewhere, um, roughly over here. And then we have e to the i 3 pi over m. And then you just keep going with this process. Through. So we got 4 somewhere and then 5. Um, and yeah, this picture really depends on what type of n you choose. I'm just, this is a picture for some n, I guess. But you'll just get all these poles over here that are equally spaced around the unit circle in the complex plane. So something like that. It's probably not the best drawing or the, not the most accurate drawing because these poles over here, they're slightly too close to the origin, I guess. But um, you guys get the idea. They're equally spaced along the unit circle. So we can draw a rough little unit circle over here. Okay, so these are our poles. So how on earth now do we construct our contour from here? Because we want to integrate from zero to infinity. Um, well, usually if you want to do the integral from zero to infinity, you can just start by taking a look at a finite interval, let's say from zero to some big radius r, where r is greater than one. So what would that look like on this picture? Well, a path, we want it to run from zero. So this is the, the starting point. And so we want, th want this to run all the way up to some big radius that we'll call r, let's say right up over here. So this is kind of like the path that we want to recover. And later we'll be taking the limits as r approaches infinity anyways, um, and then integrating along this path should recover our original integral. And I should call this i as i, or always forget to do that. So i will pop up a couple times. So that's the interval we want to evaluate, pretty much. Now, how can we do that? Well, we have a bunch of poles, so why not use Cauchy's residue theorem? That's probably going to be helpful. Now, to use that theorem, we will need um, a closed contour. So how do we enclose maybe one or several of those poles? Well, we don't need to enclose several of those poles. Enclosing one is plenty for us over here. So let's just take that first pole, e to the i pi of n to enclose, um, and yeah, we need to enclose that somehow, and then we can use Cauchy's residue theorem. Okay, um, but how do we enclose that? Well, the idea is we're going to go up along a little arc, like so. so. And then once we get to some point, which I'll tell you guys later, up over here somewhere, we're going to go all the way back down to the origin. So essentially making some kind of um, pizza slice contour here. So delicious contour. You guys should really like this one. Um, well, assuming you like pizza, I like pizza. Um, so let's just call this contour over here. Let's just call it C. Okay. So this is the contour we'll work with. Um, so we'll call each of these parts, let's call it little curvy part over here, we'll call that a gamma, and then the part that goes all the way back down, we'll call that psi. Okay, so we have a bunch of paths here to work with, and yeah, I do need to tell you what that point at the very top over here is, it's not quite clear. Um, that point is actually going to be r e to the i 2 pi and then over n. Why do we want 2 pi over n specifically? Well, that ensures that our path cuts straight through the points e to the i 2 pi over n, um, which is exactly halfway between those two poles. Um, integrating along that path is nice because then everything just works out 
perfectly pretty much and without having to do too many messy calculations. If you choose another path, then it still works, but then it's just trickier, I guess. Um, so we'll just make things simple by choosing that specific path. So that's our contour. And now we can start writing out a couple of integrals. So we'll do that on this next slide here. So what do we have so far? We have the contour integral over C of f of z dz. Now we can decompose this whole entire contour C into each of these little um, parts that make up the perimeter of the pizza. Um, namely, we have the integral from 0 up to r. Now the integral from 0 to r that's on the x-axis, so instead of writing f of z, we can just write f of x. Oh. I wanted to write f of x, but I wrote f of z for some reason. So we have f of x over here, and then we have the dx. And then what else do we have? We have the integral over big gamma. So we have plus integral over gamma, and then the integral back down along psi. So I won't bother writing the f and z's. That's implied. Uh, so integral over psi. So this is what we have here. Now each of these integrals here, we can evaluate individually. And remember, this guy over here, this integral from 0 to r, that's what we really want to recover um, because that's going to get our eye back in the very end. So how do we evaluate the contour integral? Of course, she's residue theorem. How do we evaluate the path over gamma and psi? Well, we'll figure those out later. So first of all, let's jump to the next blackboard. Why not? And we'll take a look at how to evaluate the contour integral over c of f of z dz. Um, so what do we want to do now? We want to evaluate the contour integral over c of f of z dz. So how do we do this? Well, we apply Cauchy's residue theorem, which says that the contour integral is simply the sum, or 2 pi i, times the sum of the residues. Now, you'll notice we only have one pole in there, which means we only need to evaluate exactly one residue. So this is going to give us 2 pi i, and then we have exactly one residue, so no sum here, so we have the residue, at z equals the pole, what is the pole? Well, it's going to be e to the i and then pi over n. So we want the residue at z equals e to the i pi over n. And then we take the residue of nothing other than our function f of z, like so. Okay, so how do we evaluate this residue now is the next question. Well, you'll notice one thing. We have n poles over here, all these are distinct. So you can actually factor this polynomial into linear factors. And because we have nice linear factors for each of these poles, they're um, poles of multiplicity one, or in other words, simple poles, we can just use the formula for residues at simple poles. So this is something I've derived on the channel before, or maybe you already know it. Um, but here it goes, we have two pi i. The formula at a simple pole is given by the limit as z approaches the pulse, as z approaches, oh, well, that's going to be e to the i and then pi over n. And then we take z minus the pole. z minus e to the i and then pi over n. And then we're just going to multiply this guy by our function f of z. But what is our function? Our function is precisely 1 over z to the n plus 1. So we're just going to plug that guy in right in here. So we have 1 over z to the n and then plus 1. Okay, so we need to evaluate this limit now. You may notice one problem though. As z approaches e to the i pi over n, this factor is going to be 0. And because e to the i pi over n, this was one of our poles because there was a solution to this polynomial, that's going to make this polynomial, this denominator, 0 as well. So we have 0 divided by 0 which ain't good. So we're going to use um, L'Hopital's rule now to resolve that, which um, yeah, isn't too tricky to do. So we have 2 pi i. We're just going to differentiate the top and the bottom. Um, and we still have that limit, of course. So we have the limits as z approaches, e to the i pi over n. Differentiating the top over there, that's a linear factor with a leading coefficient 1. So we just have 1. Differentiating the denominator, well, that's its power rule. So that's n and then z to the n minus 1. Okay. Um, and so now you may notice if we plug in z equals e to the i pi over n, we have no problems. Um, nothing blows up, so we can just sub it in. Okay. Um, and because we're subbing that in and we have exponents and whatnot, I do want to get that z up to the numerator by multiplying the 
power by negative, just so we don't have to deal with things on the denominator. So this is equal to, we have 2 pi i. I'm going to bring out that n over there, so we have n. And then this is going to be the limit as z approaches e to the i, and then we have pi of n. And that z, I want to bring it up to the top, so I'm just going to switch the n and the 1 around to basically multiplying the exponents by a negative, so we have 1 over n. And now we can just simply plug this in, giving us 2 pi i and over n. And then we have z, but that's going to become e to the i pi over n. And then we're raising this guy to a power, namely 1 over n. So that's the same thing as multiplying by 1 over n using our um, index laws from um, primary school or secondary school whatsoever. Okay. So now that's not too tricky to figure out. We just need to... I'll expand this a little bit, so this is equal to, well, we have 2 pi i over n. And now if you expand this, if you expand into this one, you're just going to get e to the i pi over n. So that's what we have right up over here. And now if you expand into this negative n, you're going to get e to the i negative pi. But e to the i negative pi is exactly negative 1, so we're just going to Slap a negative right up the front there. And um, that's basically the value for our contour integral over f of z that we wanted to figure out. Okay, so we'll leave that there. We'll plug it into our expressions and whatnot at the end of the video. Um, but yeah, that's the contour integral done. Um, so what's next on our list? Um, we can take a look at, let's say, the integral from zero to r. This one's really quite simple. I don't even know if I need to do it, but we'll do it anyways. So if you take a look at um, the integral, so this was our first integral over here, and our second integral, that's the integral from 0 to r, and then we have our f of x and then dx. Well, how do we evaluate this? Well, in the end, we do want to take the limit as r approaches infinity. By the way, I did forget to mention um, the results we got at the very end here for the contour integral, that's kind of independent of the radius, assuming the radius r is greater than 1, um, because if you take a look at this picture, um, if r is greater than 1, then no matter how big you make your pizza slice over here, you're still going to enclose that in one pole. So the value of the contour integral is still the same. Um, so we're assuming r is greater than 1, so that um, value is unchanged if we take the limit as r approaches infinity. Um, but this is the integral from 0 to r. What is f of x? Well, that's just going to be 1 over. We have x raised to the n and then plus 1 dx. And if you take r to infinity, well, that's just going to be the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 over x to the n plus 1. And that's exactly the i that we wanted to find at the very start of the video. So, taking the limit as r approaches infinity, we're just going to recover our i. Um, so that's the integral from 0 to r, pretty much. So this one's checked off. Let's take a look at the integral over a big gamma next. Then we'll wrap up with the integral over psi as well. So we'll do that on um, blackboard number three, I guess. Hopefully, um, I can kind of fit all these blackboards snugly up here. And you guys can still see, even though there's a little bit of a shadow there, which is annoying. Um, but that should be fine. So next integral is the integral of a gamma of f of z dz. So how do we evaluate this integral? Well, r is going to go to infinity, which, and it turns out this integral um, over this arc, it's going to vanish. Um, this is also, you can also prove this using Jordan's lemma, which I've proven in a previous video, um, but essentially because um, the integrands there, it decays as the absolute value of z gets bigger and bigger. Um, integrating along a big arc that's further and further away um, from the origin, it approaches zero. Uh, so we can show that it's not too tricky to show. Um, what we need to do, first of all, is take the absolute value. So we want to estimate this thing, so absolute values. Um, and we can use the ML inequality for this one. Again, I've done a proof of this on my channel. Um, so if you have the absolute value of a integral over some path over here, this is less than or equal to m times l. So what is m and what is l? Well, m, that's just going to be the maximum 
of the absolute value of our function um, as z varies along this path of gamma, so along gamma here. So that's um, m. And then what is L? Well, L is just going to be the length of the curve you're integrating on. So we have the length of our gamma here. So this is kind of similar to just um, if you take a look at um, functions, real valid functions on the real line. If you have a nice continuous function and so on, um, let's say you're on an interval a to b here, then the absolute value of your function on that interval is bounded above, so this is the less than a week or two, the maximum of your function on that interval, so let's say it's over here somewhere um, on A to B, times the length of your interval. So essentially, if you multiply these two together, that gives you the area of this box over here. So the integral, so the area underneath the curve is less than or equal to the area of this box that bounds it. So that's kind of like the idea of why this inequality works here in um, the complex plane as well. So we essentially, for this function, we need to find two things. We need to find the maximum and we need to find the length of gamma. Now the length of gamma is pretty straightforward. Um, this guy here. How do we find the length? Well, it's just going to be radius times angle. So radius is R, what's the angle? Well, we're gonna go from zero to, that's two pi over N, that's our angle there. So the arc length, um, if you use, use the arc length formula or whatever it's called, circle geometry, it's going to be R and then times two pi over N. So that's going to be the length of gamma. So that's the straightforward part. Now how about the maximum? This one's slightly more involved, but it's not too tricky anyways. Um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using the reverse triangle inequality. So let's just call it R um, reverse triangle inequality, so RTI. What does this say? It says that if you take the absolute value um, of A minus B, where let's say A and B are complex numbers, then this is a greater than or equal to the absolute value of the absolute value of A, and then minus the absolute value of B. Um, so the proof of this isn't too tricky, I think. You just have to use the triangle inequality in some way to, to prove this result. Um, but yeah, we want to use this somehow to bound our function f of z, find a maximum for it. So how can we get started by doing that? Well, let's take a look at the absolute value of f of z. So absolute value of f of z, what exactly is that? That is going to be the absolute value of 1 over, we have the z to the n and then plus 1 absolute value. Um, okay, but this is equal to 1 over the absolute value of z to the n and then plus 1. And maybe you see how we can use the reverse triangle inequality here. We can use it on precisely the denominator. Um, because we want to find an upper bound for this function, we want to find a lower bound for the denominator because when you reciprocate things, then the inequality signs flip over. So we want to find a lower bound for this denominator. Let's apply this reverse triangle inequality. Um, however, we're not quite there yet because we want something minus something. So how do we get something minus something? Well, we can just rewrite this as 1 over absolute value of z to the n minus negative 1, which is the exact same as positive 1. And now we can use it because we have something minus something. So if we do so, this is less than or equal to. Remember, we're finding a lower bound for this denominator which is essentially finding an upper bound for our function overall. So this is going to be less than or equal to 1 over. We have the absolute value of the absolute value of z to the n. And then we have minus the absolute value of negative 1, like so, which is 1. Okay, now the absolute value of z to the n, we can rewrite this as the absolute value of z, but raised to the nth power. So we can do that over here, 1 over... Um, and we can get rid of these absolute values as well on the outside because r is going to be greater than 1, as we'll see later. So we have the absolute value of z raised to the nth power and then minus 1. And the absolute value of z, if z varies along this path gamma here, then the absolute value of z, that's just the distance from the origin, which is precisely the radius r. So this guy, that's going to be in the end. 1 over, we have r to the n, and then minus 1. And um, yeah, we don't need absolute values on the outside because we assumed r is greater than 1 um, before. 
Okay, so this quantity here is an upper bound for the absolute value of our function. In other words, it's a maximum. So um, this guy is going to be equal to, what do we have? We have one over r to the n minus one times this length here. So that's going to be r. And then we have times two pi over n. And then we have, this is divided by r to the n and then minus one. Okay, so this is really quite nice here because you may notice as r approaches infinity, which is what we wanted to do, um, that expression there, that's going to go towards zero as r approaches infinity. Now, if that's not too clear why, it's because the degree of the polynomial on the denominator is greater than the degree of the polynomial on the numerator. There's a one and there's an n. And then we assume that the start n is greater than 1. So n is never going to be equal or less than 1, which means the denominator will always kind of overpower this numerator. So as r gets bigger, um, it's going to vanish completely. So what does this mean? It means that the absolute value of the integral over gamma in the limit is less than or equal to 0. But hang on a minute. That guy over there, that's in absolute values, which means it's always greater than zero. So if you use the Swiss theorem in some way, um, you'll get that the integral over gamma, that has to be precisely equal to zero um, as r approaches infinity. So that's basically that integral. So we've resolved this one here. We can plug that straight back in after we compute the final integral, which is the integral over psi. So integral over psi, I guess I'll just jump back to this um, seconds whiteboard here, and if, I have, and if I need more space, I'll just use this third one here. So finally, we have the integral over psi of our function f of z dz. So how do we evaluate this integral? Well, this is just an integral. It's along a path in the complex plane somehow. So if you have an integral along some path in the complex plane, it's probably best to um, parameterize it. So let's figure out a parameterization. And we might as well do it in this little spot here because we have some space. So let's take a look at the side. Well, if we want to parameterize it, what you can do is you could just simply make a substitution. Um, so we can notice that z is equal to, um, well, it's going to be equal to t e to the i 2 pi over n. And hopefully you guys can see why. It's because it's a ray in the complex plane. It has an angle of 2 pi over n, so that's the argument. And what's varying is the radius, or the um, distance from the origin. So we're varying, so our parameter is t over here, that's what we want to vary. And we want our t um, to start at, well, it's going to be r, and run away all the way back to zero. So I'm going to use some bad notation. I'm going to say z is, or t is an element of the interval from r to zero. Uh, but what this really means is t is in this range, and we're going to start at r and at zero. Um, and we also need to figure out what dz is. So dz, um, that's just differentiating this guy, which is going to give us e to the i and then 2 pi over n, and then we multiply by dt. So this is our parameterization. Um, I don't think it counts as a proper parameterization um, because we're running our parameter backwards, but it works for our purposes, so you don't really need to worry. Okay, so let's plug this into our integral. So first of all, this is going to be equal to the integral. Now, we're simply going to replace a z in our function, so f of z there, with a t e to the i2 pi over n. So what this is going to give us is we have one over, and then we have a z to the n over here, but z is replaced with a t. Um, we can well, we e to the i 2 pi over n, and we can raise all this to n. So this was our z. And then we have the plus one, which is unchanged. And then we also have, um, what is it? It is the dz at the end, which we found. It was e to the i 2 pi over n, like so. And then we have a dt. Okay, and our bounds are going to go from r back to zero. And then, yeah, that's basically our parameterization plugged in. Now we just need to clean things up. First of all, let's flip the bounds. So we're going to pick up a negative factor to counter that. Let's um, bring up that factor, e to the i, and then we have 2 pi over n. Okay, and then we have the integral from zero to r, because we flipped the bounds, of 1 over 
if you distribute this power into both those factors, we get t to the n, and then we have e to the i 2 pi over n times n, the n's are cancel, and then we're just left with e to the i times 2 pi, which is exactly equal to 1. So it's just t to the n pretty much, and then we have a plus 1 left, dt, and you may notice this integral looks very familiar. Um, it's because 1 over t to the n plus 1, well, that's just our original integral i there, but our x's are replaced with t's. That doesn't matter because t is just a dummy variable and x as well. And remember, we wanted to take limits as r approaches infinity. So what happens as r approaches infinity? Well, we're going to get minus e to the i 2 pi n over n. Um, and then we have integral from 0 to infinity, but that's just going to give us our i back once again. So that's the integral over psi. So we've evaluated, after all that work, we've evaluated all four of these integrals. So now we're ready to plug everything back in. So first of all, we found the contour integral over c. Um, what was this? That was equal to, um, it was minus 2 pi i over n, and then we had e to the negative, or what was it, I can't even remember, it was e to the i pi over n, there's no negative there. So there's e to the i pi over n, okay, and this is equal to, well, the integral from 0 to r, that became i. Um, the integral over gamma contributed absolutely nothing, so plus is 0, and then the integral over psi, well, that was, I think it was a negative, um, e to the i, 2 pi over n, and then times i. Let's check just to make sure we don't get signs mixed up. Um, yes, it was negative e to the i, yep, 2 pi over n times i. So this is the expression we're able to get by evaluating all those integrals. But this is just an algebraic equation in terms of i, and i was exactly what we wanted to solve for, so we're just going to solve this equation. So um, just primary school maths from here, almost. Um, but yeah, what's the first thing we can do? I want to bring the i's together somehow. So on the right-hand side, um, we can write this as i. Um, and then we have, well, what's that going to be? Actually, what we'll do, just so we don't have to think too much later, um, let's bring this guy onto the other side. So this is going to be e to the i. 2 pi over n times i. We'll also bring this i onto the other side, so minus i. And then this is equal to, and we'll bring this term on the left-hand side all the way to the right-hand side, so that's going to be 2 pi i, and then over n, and we have e to the i pi over n, like so. Next thing we'll do, we'll factor out i everywhere, so this i can factor to the back, let's say, and then we just had negative i there, so this is just a minus 1 overall, with parentheses. And we're almost there, we just need to um, isolate i by dividing both sides by this factor. Um, but we can do a little bit more than that. Um, we'll notice that there's some exponential factors or exponential terms on both sides. Let's try to get all the exponential factors on this side here. And something nice will happen. Um, if we multiply both sides by e to the minus i pi over n. What you'll get is, well, here we're going to get e to the minus, or well, not minus, we'll just get 1 pi over n, because we had 2 pi over n, we have a negative pi over n, which we're multiplying by onto the other side, and then we have minus e to the minus i pi over n, because we multiplied by exactly this factor, and then we have divided, and then we have times i, being equal to, so this factor here is gone because we um, cancelled it, we're left with pi over n, and now notice there's a 2i here, which we can divide on to the left-hand side, because this left-hand side looks almost like a sine function, it's just missing that 2i, which we'll just um, steal from the right-hand side, so this is divided by 2i, and now this guy, that's a sine, All right? So now, what do we have? So this tells us that the sine function, and it's sine of pi over n here, so sine of pi over n times i here is equal to pi over n. And then we're basically done from here because, um, yeah, we just need to divide both sides by sine of pi over n. And we'll get our final 
expression for i, or final solution. So therefore i, that's going to be equal to, we have pi over n, and then all this is divided by the sine of pi over n. And this here, this is the final answer for today's video, um, which, um, yeah, looks like I did everything right because that's the exact result I got in my other videos. Um, so, um, yeah, no algebraic mistakes, which is um, good to know. So that's um, pretty much all for this video here. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed. Um, don't know if you guys like the blackboard videos more than the whiteboard videos. I might still do whiteboard videos at home, um, but I'll have to hide behind the camera, unfortunately. But yeah, blackboard videos are pretty fun to do, actually. Um, I like writing with chalk and whatnot. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I'll do blackboard videos whenever I get the chance to at uni. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all for today. Hope you guys enjoyed. Um, yeah, just give me one moment. Um, just got to wrap up this video here. Take way too long. Come on now. Just give me. Yep. Yep. Okay. So. See you guys next time. I don't want to disturb that guy too much. He needs to clean the whiteboard for the next video. So up to the next one, have a wonderful day, and I'll see everyone later. Bye. That guy's outro takes forever sometimes, you know? I have to wait for him all the time. I always have to clean these blackboards, yeah? He just um, films the videos and leaves them. And no one cleans them. I have to clean them. Because he wants to make more videos. Um, and he doesn't want to clean blackboards, but it makes me clean them.